Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here today to engage in learning and reflection and action on how Nebraska can increase opportunity and access to the good life for all young children and families in Nebraska. It's a privilege to be here with you today, and you are in, we are in for an amazing day. Now, for those of you um, for whom you were here for the first Thriving Conference last year in Kearney, you remember, may remember that I shared with you a definition of high quality early care and education that included what it is and what it takes. For you first timers, I'm going to very quickly introduce the definition of high quality. And our keynote speaker today, Dr. Helen Rakes, will take us to an incredible new understanding. Of course, this conference is not just about learning. It is not like most conferences. The purpose of this conference is to stimulate change, to help all of us connect with each other and reflect and go back to our communities to make Nebraska's communities the best in the nation for young children and families. So what do we mean when we talk about high quality early care and education? So to begin, quality refers to the experiences a child has regardless of the setting. Quality refers to what a child experiences in her home, in her grandmother's home, in the family child care home, in the child care center, in the preschool or pre-K, in the kindergarten and primary grades. What a child needs is the same across all those settings. Now, based on brain science and over 50 years of solid research, we know what types of experiences a child needs in her youngest years in order to develop and learn well. We know types of experiences a child needs in the first eight years of life in order to have warm relationships and, that support happiness and health. In essence, we know what experiences a young child needs to have the good life. From years of brain science and um, slide, thank you. From years of brain science and research on how children develop, we know that children need to experience physical and emotional safety, warm relationships, and interactions that summarized, if a bit neatly and a bit over simply, are called serve and return. Let's quickly unpack these. From the first weeks of life, young children carefully watch and listen to adults and use their instincts to assess how safe they are. They learn quickly and early to feel better when a grown-up, a close, caring grown-up is in the room, and a little less well when that grown-up leaves the room. Babies can tell when their special adult is anxious or sad, and when that adult feels safe, they feel safe. Babies need adults to make good decisions for their safety. They need to know what to eat, where they can climb, what they can go in their mouth, and what cannot. Babies and young children need to experience physical safety and know that when they're hungry, they'll be fed, when they're wet, they'll be changed, and when the world is just too much, they'll be held until they feel much better and safe again. Babies and young children need to know that when a scary new person walks in the room, someone will be paying attention and responding to make them feel safe. Babies and young children need to be safe but they also need to actually experience that safety. In the words of educator Alfie Cohn, if children feel safe, they can take risks, ask questions, make mistakes, learn to trust, share their feelings, and grow. From years of brain science and solid research, we also know how children develop, and what they need is something called serve and return. Serve and return is just shorthand, and you'll see why. It's for supportive human interactions, characterized by frequent, one-on-one, -on -one, warm, language-rich interactions that support learning. 
Babies and young children need constant human interactions that affirm that what they know will extend their learning. And children need these experiences regardless of where they spend their days and nights. Quality is what a child experiences. They can experience poor quality or high quality. They need safety in relationships and serve in return. So what can adults do to ensure that children experience high quality? What will increase the likelihood that children experience physical and emotional safety, warm supporting relationships, and frequent one-on-one -on -one language rich educational interactions with caring adults? The practices and policies that we, the adults, provide to increase the likelihood that children experience the safety and relationships and interactions. These provisions are our best bets, but they're not our best guesses. We know from years of research and experience what children need to learn and develop well. So what are these provisions? What can we do? We need families to be supportive, but in order to do that, Families need to be supported. We need interactions between children and adults to be warm, one-on-one, -on -one, language-rich, frequent, and educational. In contexts of group learning and in individual interactions, we need instruction to be intentional, which often means curriculum-based, but always means that they consider the whole child and the individual child's differences. Be clear, when you are with a young child, you are always a teacher. Whether intentional or not, a child is always learning. Thus, if you're with a child, one is always teaching. Programs need to provide early care and education that provides space and materials and sets up a setting to allow for that safety and interactions. Communities. We need communities to provide the policies and the practices and the resources that increase the likelihood that the rest of the system can deliver quality provisions for children to experience quality. We need to make sure that all children experience physical and emotional safety, warm supportive relationships, and serve in return. It is not easy, but it can be done. And in these next days, you're going to hear about some communities in Nebraska who are making this happen. So let's get started. It's my privilege today, my real privilege, to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Helen Rakes. I first encountered Dr. Helen Rakes through her writings when I was a graduate student in Wisconsin. Her writings were about parent-child relationships, child care, and how families living in poverty could be supported in raising their children. Back then, Dr. Rakes' research program and policy work on behalf of young children and families was already known and respected. Dr. Helen Rakes is the Willa Cather Professor in Child, Youth, and Family Studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Dr. Rakes earned her doctorate in child development from Iowa State University, where she studied how mothers could be supported after giving birth. She earned a master's in human development from the University of California at Davis and a bachelor's degree from Iowa State University. Before joining the faculty in U at UNL in 2005, Dr. Rakes worked for 13 years as an early childhood and youth research specialist with the Gallup Foundation. Leading up to that post, Dr. Rakes served in a variety of positions at state and national levels. She consulted for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to provide leadership around Head Start and early Head Start programs, which, which Dr. Mazels referenced. She directed a high-quality early childhood program herself where she co-developed a curriculum for infants and toddlers. But there's some things you should know for when Dr. Rakes is the subject of your favorite trivia night. <laughs> she shared much of her adult life with the esteemed Senator Ron Rakes. She is a mother of three and a grandmother of five. 
Helen's initial education and career was in journalism. And, wait for it, the internationally renowned Dr. Helen Rakes once worked as a wrangler at a dude ranch in Colorado. <laughs> in addition to being known as a scholar and advocate for children and families, Dr. Rakes is known as a consummate teacher and mentor. She's prepared countless early childhood professionals in California, in Iowa, and most notably in Nebraska. She's known for unqualified, educational, warm support and mentoring she provides for her students to ensure that they are provided what they need to experience high quality, higher education. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Helen Rakes of the University of Nebraska. Wow, thank you, Kathleen. That was beautifully put together. Um, good morning, everybody. Wow, it's exciting to see over 400 of you out there from all over the state, early childhood providers, state leaders, community leaders. What a great opportunity. You've heard it before, and it's really true. What a great opportunity we have here today um, to take our work in early childhood education potentially to the next level. Gratitude to the Buffett Early Childhood Institute and Myriad Partners mentioned in the program for bringing us all together here uh, in Nebraska. I do want to say we have many, many people in Nebraska who are deeply invested in early childhood education. And I want to acknowledge all of these people, many of whom are in the audience here today. But it, take, it takes a village, right? <laughs> yes. We've made a lot of progress in the past 20 years, but we have a long ways to go yet. So that's what we're gonna talk about here today. So our topic, thriving children, caregivers, and communities. Thriving at all the levels, why not? Um, so here's where we're going this morning. First at each level, what does thriving look like? We're gonna spend a little time trying to define it and it's not as easy to define as you might think. Then we'll take a look at where we are today, and Sam Meisel started us in that process, but we'll develop it further, um, and with some examples of the good things that are happening, but also some of the gaps that we have. And then we'll talk about what it might take, at least with exemplars, um, to go to the next level. Dare I say this? Okay, I think I will. I think this is gonna be a banner year for early childhood education in Nebraska. Agree? <laughs> Let's do it, right? <laughs> okay. What does thriving mean? Um, here's a common definition, to grow vigorously and to prosper, to be successful. So in keeping with our theme for the conference, let's say that having thriving young children is the ultimate goal. Nebraska Children and Families Foundation has set as its 10-year strategic goal, lead an ongoing call to action for thriving children. The Buffett Early Childhood Goal uh, the Institute's mission statement is for Nebraska, you've heard it twice already today, to be the best place in the country to be a baby. However, I think it's fair to say, see if you agree with this, that our operational goals are more often on the negative side, as important as they are, and they are immensely important, but to reduce deficits of some type. So I wanna talk about thriving children. Thriving children is a very positive aspiration for us. I think it's also fair to say if thriving is the goal, then it introduces some new opportunities. Maybe some things we haven't thought about in the past. And that's pretty exciting. But what does it really mean? Ooh, I'm gonna ask you to talk to your neighbor for just a minute or so about how you know at a community or state level when our children are thriving. And I'm not gonna call on anybody to come up here, so you know, it's just okay, let it out here. How do you know when the children in our communities or state are thriving? What's your definition? Mm 
Oh, and I mean all young children, all young children in the community. <laughs> Okay, did you figure it out? <laughs> Is it, good job. It's like calling a group of teenagers back. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna get back to, back to boring statistics. <laughs> so, good job, everybody. <laughs> Way to go to work. <laughs> And we have lots of work to do today. All right, so I'm sure it might seem like knowing if we have driving children should be somewhat obvious. I mean, wouldn't you just kind of think that? Um, but I will contend it's not really so obvious, so we need to be very wise about it. We're going to hunker down now and try to define what we mean and how we would know if we were doing it. But first, a little background. So I'm gonna have a lot of statistics to share with you. I mean, I really do love um, you know, our statistics and our charts and so forth too, but I know not everybody <laughs> is as in love with it as I am. So um, let's have a little fun before we get started. So play along with me. I'm also an early childhood um, person, so I'm gonna take some liberties here. You've probably all heard of the nursery rhyme. This is the house that Jack built. Who's heard of that before? Okay, okay, pretty good here. Um, so, um, just to remind you though. This is the house that Jack built. This is the mom that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. Okay. This is the cat that chased the rat that ate the malt that lay in the house that Jack built. Okay, well, I guess we don't get to see Jack, but um, you, <laughs> you, you get the idea there. So anyway, I have a Nebraska version of it, and this little ditty speaks to the work or the opportunity we get to do together here and to, to the many, many interrelationships among children, caregivers, community leaders, and vitality for all, and it goes like this. Okay, this is the town that communities in Nebraska built. This is the child that, good job, Rebecca, that thrived in the town that communities in Nebraska built. These are the parents who supported the child that thrived in the town that communities in Nebraska built. These are the teachers and educators and providers who partnered with the parents and supported every child to thrive in the towns that communities in Nebraska built. These are community leaders who raised the funds and created the policies and worked together to support the parents and support the teachers and educators and providers to support the child that, that to thrive in the towns that communities in Nebraska built. And these are the children who thrived on support and teachers and providers um, from parents, excuse me, these are the children who thrived on support from teachers and providers and parents and were ready for kindergarten and thrived in school who lived in the towns that communities in Nebraska built. And these are the adults, the parents and educators who moved to and contributed and lived in the thriving towns that communities in Nebraska built. And this is Nebraska, slide, where it all happened, <laughs> where children are thriving and caregivers too, where it comes down to communities and to you. <laughs> My ditty. 
forgiveness, you know, one could be a scientist and an early childhood educator at the same time here. <laughs> okay, thriving children, thriving at the child, parent, caregiver, community levels, they're all interrelated. Let's look at them one by one. Um, children, caregivers, communities. First, the children. Some might say thriving means you reach your potential, your genetic potential. First, let's take a look at the deep science around thriving, genes and the environment, or nature and nurture. We can ask, which children get to thrive? Which children come closest to fulfilling their genetic potential? Who thrives? Slide. Okay, who remembers the idea of nature versus nurture? Well, here's how we see it now. Of course, we're all constrained somewhat by our genes. Some of our characteristics are determined by our genes largely. For example, eye color. How many brown-eyed people are in this room here today? Okay, how many blue-eyed people? You didn't have a thing to do with making that happen. <laughs> it's a gift from your parents. But other characteristics related to our intelligence and competencies in other areas are a result of interactions between our genes and our environment, nature and nurture. I want to tell you about two sets of studies that address the complex science of how nature and nurture interact and what that has to do with helping children thrive. Let me say that it is the nurture part that we have opportunities to do something about during this very, very critical time, this time of rapid brain growth and when developmental trajectories are established, as you heard from Kathleen already, during the first five years of life. We will turn later to looking at the influences that determine who thrives, the genetics. Okay, the, here we go. <laughs> um, we're out of early childhood play now, and we're, we're on to data. Um, <laughs> so bear with me. Um, the first study was done by Eric Turkheimer, University of Virginia, who demonstrated that environment or nurture ma matters more for poor children than for advantaged children. For advantaged children, it's about 50-50 genes and environment. But for poor children, he examined SES, but keep in mind that other factors weigh in to restrict children's potential. The ratio is more like 10% for genes and 90% for environment. Another way to put it is children in poor environments do not reach their genetic potential as readily as children in advantaged environments. He demonstrated this in complicated studies of twins, poor and more advantaged, raised together and raised apart, and found higher correlations among twins who were more advantaged, and from that he calculates that genes play a stronger role for advantaged children. Okay, look at the red line particularly. It shows as income goes up from left to right, so does genetic influence. So children from poor environments are at risk for not reaching their genetic potential. Um, due to downward pulls and too little upward momentum in their environments. A second study is in the nature nurture world, comes from Dr. Tom Boyce, University of California, San Francisco. Okay, how many of you have ever tried to keep an orchid alive? <laughs> Who's been successful at that? <laughs> oh, a few people, I love it. I have one that I got in June and it's still going and I think it's my longest stretch. Um, but how many of you um, have ever tried to keep a dandelion alive? <laughs> Who's ever tried to kill a dandelion? <laughs> you can't do it, okay? So Tom Boyce's book, The Orchid and the Dandelion, makes the case that dandelions are the hardy kids who can survive in most environments, but orchids are those who are temperamentally, genetically more sensitive and vulnerable. And for these children, environment makes all the difference. He also makes the case that all children, because they're children, are in fact orchids, but some are more orchid-like than others. So as Kate has told us, serve and return matters, but for some it needs to be absolutely precise. Or for a child in an impoverished environment, if she is lacking good serve and return, a caring teacher can help set the rhythm. 
Um, in all developing brains requires stimulation, but for some children who have lacked opportunities, it can help bring the brain to life. So that is some of the deep science behind thriving. We could talk about this all day long, but we're going to move on now um, and talk about how do we think about thriving in Nebraska. It's harder than you might think to define thriving in a way that is measurable. Nebraska Children and Families Foundation raised this question. How do we know when our children are thriving? We're practical here in Nebraska, I think you would agree, um, and we want to know if what we're doing is working. So we want a way of thinking about thriving that sets the stage for our work. I'm going to provide you four ways of thinking about thriving, and I also know that many of these 90-some communities represented out here are doing an amazing job already of beginning to measure child indicators for their community. Um, so I'm gonna talk about these four buckets, and if you can, if you feel comfortable doing this, raise your hand when I ask you if the indicator of thriving that you talked about falls in that bucket. <laughs> okay, we'll just, we'll just see what we have. A first approach is just looking at the children, all right? The presence of well-being, healthy, nourished, learning, competent speakers, social emotional skills, kindergarten readiness. We don't have too many measures of these, nothing really across the state. Maybe APGAR scores in the birth records, um, some health indicators, but that's about it till you get to third grade reading, um, which I'll be about which I'll be more specific in a minute. Okay, how many people came up with indicators in this bucket? Raise your hand. A few. Okay, a few, a few did. Okay, we'll see which buckets you fell into. The second bucket. Presence of supports for children's experiences, the things that adults do to help children thrive. Kate talked at length about the importance of quality childcare, serve and return interactions. We have measures of quality and step up to quality. What else do we need to know? How many people mentioned things in this bucket when you were talking? More, okay. Um, Third, the truth is, at this early stage, we talk about thriving, but most of our indicators, as important as they are, and they are important, point to the removal of deficits in what the child experiences. For example, progress in infant mortality. How many of you picked indicators in this bucket, which I'll call the removal of deficits? Okay, a, num a number of people did too. Other people had broad conversations here. <laughs> or maybe it, you, what you talked about was in this category. So there's one more way to think about thriving. When you get an invitation to do something like this, you know, it's really an invitation to grow in some ways. And so you can picture me out walking um, in Ashland, you know, out on the farm with my little white earbuds in my ear, listening to books on tape on thriving, okay? And one of them I came across, I was attracted to. Arianna Huffington writes about thriving as having a sense of wonder, wisdom, curiosity. It might also be having a growth mindset. I haven't seen statewide measures of curiosity or a sense of wonder, but I love knowing it could be out there as something just out of our reach, but part of what we think is important. It would be so brilliant of us in Nebraska when developing our thriving indicators to develop an indicator of wonder, curiosity, or growth mindset. Did anybody have an indicator in this bucket? They said, oh, I love it. Okay, we're gonna talk here. <laughs> All right, by any definition, how close are we to the goal of helping children thrive during the years birth to eight? And I, I will contend, we don't have too many ways of knowing about the children in Nebraska in these early years. To set the stage though, and maybe what I'll do is go through this a little more quickly because Sam referred us to some of these statistics already, um, but I'm drawing a lot from the Voices for Children Kids Count report. Um, about a quarter of children are under five in Nebraska, another quarter in the five to eight range. So we're talking about half of the half a million children under 18 in Nebraska. Is, that's who we're talking about here today. Okay, this map of percentages of children at risk by legislative districts was provided by Nebraska First Five. And it illustrates that about 39% of children five and under live at or below 185% of poverty, and about 20% actually are in deep poverty too. 
We know that poverty introduces major barriers for young children through many routes. In the districts, darkest orange and red, so now look at this really carefully, the rate is 41% and 50% respective, respectively. Districts over 50% of children at risk due to poverty include, now it's gonna sound like a Powerball call off, but I'm, I'm gonna do it, and you know what district you're from. 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 36, 46, 48 in all parts of the state. And those with 41 to 50% of children at risk due to poverty include 8, 9, 15, 23, it's my own district, um, 36, 37, 42, 44, and 47. And I, I do this, I know many of our legislators and state board members have seen these maps before, but I think it's really important to own, if this is where we're from, we've got, to, we've got some work to do, so let, let us know about this. Infant mortality rate um, per thousand live births and an overall symbol of the health of a society is 5.6 per thousand. It's slightly improved, it's slightly down, but it's three times higher for African Americans and two times higher for Native Americans, introducing a racial disparity that runs through nearly all of our child well-being indicators. 92% 0.5 are born of normal birth rate, 16.6% have of pregnant mothers have inadequate prenatal care, but that is more than double for Native Americans and just under double for Hispanics and African Americans. 17% of children are experiencing food insecurity. Um, over 40% of the 3,600 some children reported for maltreatment were four and under. So child abuse is pretty prevalent during for young children. At the end of the early childhood period, we know that 53% achieved proficiency in reading on the NISA, the Nebraska State Accountability Survey. And reading proficiency is a pretty good indicator of success to come in school. So these data are the next data that I'm showing are nationwide, but they hold up in every state. You've probably, you are probably well familiar with this. Um, the first slide shows this phenomenon that I, I would assume most everybody in the room is familiar with. But the lower the SES on the left, the greater the school readiness gap between low income and advantaged children at kindergarten entry. The second slide is one I like because it tells a story. Okay, it's from a representative study. This is me and my you know, love affair <laughs> with charts and numbers and so forth. But, but it, it's from a representative study to begin with of kindergartners from across the US. On the left, you see reading language scores at kindergarten entry divided into 10 groups or deciles from lowest to highest. Then on the right are the fifth grade scores for the same children, because it's a longitudinal study, and you can see the lines of children in the aggregate do not cross. Children who start in the lowest decile remain in the lowest and so on. Now that doesn't mean any individual child isn't maybe able to cross over, but in the aggregate, this is what we see. So these two slides taken together tell you why school principals and superintendents are now so interested in early childhood education in communities with large numbers of children at risk due to poverty. So what will it take for our children in our communities to thrive? Kate shared many of the ingredients, and we'll talk about them some, but I want to say this. I would say what it takes begins with a vision. For young children to thrive in Nebraska, it begins with aiming for thriving for all the children. I will contend it matters what the goal is. I will suggest thriving for all children in a community should be the goal, but it's gonna be hard to do, and harder still to measure it entirely. But how we think about this will drive what we measure, and what we measure will drive what we do. So I would say our vision for thriving might encompass all the dimensions, all the buckets we talked about, but perhaps will vary community by community. So imagine a continuum where thriving is on the right and failure to thrive is on the other end. However, as noted, we tend to know more about the negative side than the positive side of things. I've anchored not thriving with two syndromes, one of which you've probably heard about, failure to thrive. It occurs when children are well-nourished, but they don't grow. Why? Because of lack of serve and return, lack of loving interactions. 
But the second one, I really want you to know about this. It's a recently discovered syndrome um, called resignation syndrome, newly discovered among children of immigrants in Sweden. So people who've immigrated to Sweden, often for political refuge, where elementary and the middle school age children literally go into a coma for sometimes a year or more, and they come out of it with deep psychiatry where they can be assured their family, often families who themselves have been traumatized, has hope. Resignation syndrome occurs when children do not feel safe. When they do not feel safe. We must learn about how safe our children of immigrants are feeling in Nebraska. It's going to be hard to do, but we must learn how safe our children of immigrants in Nebraska are feeling. Speaking to hope, the continuum is anchored on the far right with thriving. We don't actually have population level measures of this, but we know what we want. We are looking for holistic development of children, children who are safe and healthy, building beautiful brains that enable them to learn and be successful in school and with sufficient support. Children, forgive me for this, with a relaxed HPA system that are not on hyper alert due to danger and want, trauma and hunger, or expectations that adults cannot help them. Children with neurons in the brain that are talking to each other, building these super highways due to nourishment and interesting stimuli. Children who show up in your kindergarten classes with inventive language skills, who can wait, lead, follow, show affection, relate to children and adults, and have ideas and hope. The challenge at this early stage falls to our amazing data community, and I know there are representatives of this amazing community here today, um, to get married, all right, are you ready for this, to state and community leaders. We have many measures and indicators, and you can see with the Kids Count Report, it's a good example. However, except for our health indicators, meaningful measures of thriving in early childhood are in short supply or non-existent. Data people will provide what is possible in community and state leaders with their visions for their communities, and the state can push for measures of what's aspirational. Okay, let's turn to caregivers. Who are we talking about? Parents, educators, providers of all kinds, including healthcare providers. The theme continues on two levels. So on the first level, it's like, what do caregivers need to do so that children thrive? But however, in the ways these things are all interconnected with each other, we know that they can best do this when they're thriving themselves. So what do we do to help caregivers thrive? Parents, educators, providers of all types. What do environments that support thriving as it pertains to caregivers look like? Kate provided us a beginning picture of these environments. We look for consistent child care, early child environments that are safe and providing stimulation. In other words, of high quality. Parents providing safety and quality, serve in return and stimulation. And what do we know about where we are today when it comes to caregiving environments? All right, and some of this you heard about from Sam, uh, but you, you can hear this more than once before it begins to really drive home. We know that 75% of children in Nebraska under six and had all available parents in the workforce in 2017. That information is from the Kids Count report. Wow, so we're in a state where lots of people need childcare. You've heard it again and again. 25,000 plus children are in school-based preschool that might involve uh, programs in schools or it might involve community partnerships in childcare um, that schools have formed with them. Head Start or Early Learning Network or Sixpence. I will mention that the 16,000 in these school-based preschools and partners is a four times increase since the year 2000. That's huge. Kudos to the state of Nebraska for that. Okay, some areas of the state um, have licensed childcare available, but some don't. You've heard that. See the gray areas of this chart. Um, and we know that we have about 3,000 licensed childcare facilities, but only a little more than 300 are in the Step Up to Quality program. So that's in that second map there. 
According to the Voices Report, um, the cost of childcare in Nebraska today is about 12,000 a year per child, but about 30,000 children receive childcare subsidies with payments averaging around 500 a month. So I don't know if you're doing the math right now, but if you do, you'll see it comes up to what they're paid is about half the figure on an annual basis. So these are just a few of the gaps. What are the barriers? For parents, these are the barriers that need to be addressed or managed in order to deliver optimal interaction to children. Um, include things that get in the way of being a sense of sensitive interactions like stressors of adult life that include things from mental health to poverty to immigration, substance abuse, food insecurity, financial pressures, poor or non-existing childcare, or time pressures. For caregivers, who are the, the educators and providers, what gets in the way? Well, actually many of the same things that can create barriers for parents. Um, so one that I want to highlight are wages of teachers and providers in early childhood programs. I have information from two sources. One is from a study recently released in California. In California, the early childhood teachers receive half the pay of their counterparts teaching children just a little older than, and infant toddler teachers get even less. What about in Nebraska? Um, today, in your program, you see in the centerfold that we see the median salary for child care professionals was uh, listed there at 19, around 19,000, 18,706, and K3 teachers at about 41,000. All right, now we have at the Buffett Institute people, though, have looked at this in a more fine-grained way, and they see, show, even for teachers who have bachelor's degrees, salaries were Exciting, this is exciting. This part is great, 32,450 for those who were in preschool-based settings. So these are the people who are in these school-based partnerships, um, but actually are employed by the school system itself. They might be in a partnership too in terms of childcare, and there we see in childcare settings 22,800 is about the average salary for a teacher with a bachelor's degree who is teaching in a childcare center. So there's some work to do. Um, I think we've made recent progress. Um, but as the California study showed, um, there are many teachers are underpaid still, leading to high levels of turnover in the field. And another way to put it is that what parents can afford to pay is not enough to provide teachers with a fair wage and ensure high quality care and education for young children. I should mention that there are reports in the pipeline coming from the Buffett Institute and others for Nebraska on this very topic. So we'll be waiting with bated breath. Okay, let's go back to our aspiration. If communities provide quality early childhood programs and if parents provide warm relationships and stimulation, will children thrive? There is abundant uh, evidence documenting the importance of early parenting and about the importance of good quality programs. Let's take a quick look. Um, if parents provide warmth and stimulation, children will probably thrive, regardless of their income level. Um, the famous um, study of early childcare launched by NICHD in the mid-90s showed that parenting accounted for the greatest amount of the variance in children's kindergarten readiness scores. So bear with me on this slide. It's from a poverty level sample showing children at age three who had the best vocabularies had parents who had high levels of warmth, responsiveness, literacy and talk to, and lots of books and stimulation. Children who received highest levels on all of these threes, the bars on the right, um, were, um, had parents who were performing who were doing all these things, and these children were performing at national averages with little or no achievement gap. All right, and these kids were in deep poverty. All parents want what's best for their children, and these findings underscore the importance of reminding busy and pressured parents of the importance of daily reading, um, or daily language interactions with their children, such as is happening with 
Ready Rosie. How many of you are participating in Ready Rosie around the state? Oh, I love it. See, just look around here. <laughs> Our weekly videos are disseminated to parents with reminders and models of language interactions with young children. Um, we have over 200 classrooms in Nebraska enrolled in Ready Rosie, from Pender to ESU 13, from Red Cloud to Winnebago. As of last week, there were 13 1,584 parents of young children enrolled in this program throughout the state, all watching a new video um, that comes to their parents' phones each week with ideas and reminders to talk to their children. There are many studies showing advantages for low-income children attending high-quality programs. There's plenty of evidence in quality programs that low-income children gain on national averages about three points a year, and some show much greater gains. Um, the bars on the left were from data from 17 rural communities around the U.S., including some in Nebraska, with many low-income families. All children entering kindergarten in these communities were administered quick but reliable um, receptive language tests every year for six years. Um, and this is what we saw year after year. Blue bar represents the scores of those who qualified for free and reduced lunch and had at least a year of school-based preschool, which includes these programs that are community partnerships um, and, uh, head and or Head Start. And the yellow, those at a similar level. Okay, we're looking at the bars on the left. Um, so those um, who did not have pre-K or Head Start. Every year, that three-point difference that you can see on children's kindergarten language scores showed up across the country. And these bars probably even underestimate the differences because of family child care and center-based private care wasn't even in the sample. The next bars show differences at age five for children who had three years of early Head Start and the next one's a famous Perry Preschool Project and then the last three scores for Educare. So you can see the blue bars always represent those children who've had the early childhood experiences in their communities and they most often, these are all from programs serving children who are at risk due to income. Um, I know you know about the lifetime advantages of early childhood education, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let that one go in the interest of time. But suffice it to say that in longitudinal studies such as the Perry Preschool Project, third bar on the, from the left, um, the adults who had been in this program were more likely to graduate high school, they had higher incomes and less crime. Okay, so. That's how I want to show now some Nebraska data, because I know that's what you really love to see. Um, and in, from the first study I showed you was from Save the Children's Early Steps to School Success. The bars on the left are from Schuyler. Is anybody here from Schuyler today? I know there's some people who've lived in Schuyler <laughs> in the past, okay. So um, they show a three-point advantage in English kindergarten scores for children whose first language is Spanish. The second set of bars uh, for kindergartners are from Fremont, demonstrating a seven-point advantage among children who are receiving free and reduced lunch, who attended um, school partners or school-based uh, preschool or Head Start. So is there anybody here from Fremont today? Okay, yes. Uh, I'm gonna shout you guys out again too because there's a lot going on that's great. We have similar evidence from some of our other programs, our McVie programs, our Healthy Families America from Sixpence and so on, Head Start. So we know why principals and superintendents in Nebraska in early childhood education then are so excited about early childhood. So let's hear from one of them. The schools that are um, overcoming some of those high risk factors are the schools that are taking control of their own destiny and saying, why would I wanna miss out on a two year old, a three year old with all that sort of um, potential for learning. What early childhood does is gives these kids a foundation before they ever hit kindergarten, which gives them so much more of a chance to get through it with graduation. That I think if we aren't providing early childhood education, we've missed the boat with those kids. Thank you. If you're not a believer, your fellow principals and superintendents who will bring you along. So what will it take? There is a lot to do at the caregiver, thriving caregiver level. We definitely need to 
address our shortages in quality early care. You've heard that several times already today. We need to renew our commitment to quality um, through step up to quality enrollment. We need to continue to expand and refine caregiver support programs. And um, here's where I want to say too, what this um, map refers to are places in the state where rooted in relationships and the positive behavior supports or commonly known as the pyramid model is is in operation. And so there, there's more than one way to be supporting caregivers, and these are just a couple of examples. In my tiny print, you can see there really are quite a few things going on in Nebraska along these lines. But then we need to continue to expand and refine parent support programs too. And believe me, we have a number of pretty amazing parent support programs going on in Nebraska. I'll call out one, bringing up Nebraska, who, which is the um, program developed by our First Lady of Nebraska, but it's a very exciting one. And finally, we need to build the early childhood workforce um, in two ways, at least, maybe in a hundred ways, and one of them is by providing alternate routes to certification and to excellence, and the other, another way is to grapple with that hard, hard job of thinking about salaries. Okay. So now let's turn to communities. There's one more part, all right? <laughs> two thirds of the way through here. Um, Communities. What do we do in our communities to create thriving children? Here's where we knuckle down and select from that continuum of indicators. What will give you the greatest leverage that is the most important in your community, in Norfolk, in Schuyler, in Gehring? Um, what are the good goals that address the needs in your communities? And that brings us to our collaborations and community connections. So the image I have, and actually this sort of fits it, is big tent. Big tent in your community, big tent in the state. Everybody's in it, it's, it's inclusive, all parties are at the table working together. Another image I have is of Fremont, okay. <laughs> um, I visited their community coalition several times now, and I found it incredible how inclusive it was and how active and operative. So I know what these coalitions look like and they're beautiful. So what does thriving look like in communities? Many communities or counties now have early childhood councils and this map illustrates that. And I'm told, um, so the green watering cans are, can, are areas that counties that have councils and the gray were ones that were emerging and I've told most of the emergings are now active. So that's very exciting. In addition, um, there are some 25 communities that have that are referred to as communities for kids who go more deeply into coalition work for early childhood education, so hoorah. What will it take? What can you do? Um, some things that you might ask, is there a coalition? Is everyone under the tent? Are we using all of our local resources? Uh, like for example, pulling family childcare into the coalition. Do we have a shared vision for our goals? Are we using local data? Can we improve on the data? Are we measuring the most important things for our community and our goals? Are we using our resources to, for maximum leverage? Okay, and here I want to emphasize three Examples. Okay, one example. Many of who's in a, from a sixpence program here in the audience today? Quite, quite yes, great. Sixpence. Um, we have over 40 projects in school districts that now receive sixpence funds for home visiting or center based program and to leverage schools to help improve quality and share resources with local childcare. And what's so beautiful about this is that it provides resources for existing programs and partnerships with schools to commit to quality on a match by match by match basis. That's why it's called Sixpence. A second example, okay, and then I'm gonna talk about funding even more deeply, okay, so stick with me for just a minute. <laughs> Can we incentivize providers uh, participating in Step Up to Quality or if they are in the program trying to move up the ladder? So there are two issues around Step Up to Quality. One is getting people enrolled, but the second one is getting them to, encouraging them to move. So Step Up 
to quality. It's like a five-star hotel system, if I may be so brief, but it involves four levels. Um, you come in at one level, and then you continue to work towards improving quality. But it's, it's a challenging process, but um, good if one is participating. So are there community-level ways to um, support providers' enrollment? For example, you've probably heard about Lincoln Littles. Is anybody familiar with this, this effort? A few people are. Oh, there's somebody there who's driving it. Um, for example, <laughs> she should come up here then. So the Lincoln Community Foundation established a fund for providers at higher levels of step up to quality that supplements subsidy payments for low-income children. OK, because remember I talked about that gap between what they're getting and what the cost of quality care is, even in Nebraska. This led to the lowest income children having access to the highest quality care and to the percent of providers who started moving up the ladder. So it, it incentivized on two levels. Third, okay, how do we, we have great aspirations, how do we pay for this? Um, I, I'm sure this question has never occurred to anybody else. Right? <laughs> so I was talking to Joan Lombardi, who I know is a good friend of many of you in the room. She's a former assistant secretary, Department of Health and Human Services in certain administrations. And she said to me, there's a tsunami of community efforts occurring across the nation today, but Nebraska was one of the first. So kudos to Nebraska for the extreme and fabulous community effort we had. But then she says, they need more funding. <laughs> Right? Okay, so we'll take the compliment, but we also need the funding at the community level. Okay, a couple of ideas, and I know there are more out there. We heard about LB160 that might provide some possibilities. I'm looking for our state senators here in the, in the audience. Um, the learning community legislation, and I know about this because my husband was, late husband was involved in developing the legislation. It wasn't just developed for Omaha. It was something that was envisioned to be of use throughout the state. Okay, so it means then, though, that three districts can come together and they become a learning community, and, you know, and if you pass muster, I guess, and meet all the, the gates, um, you can levy for funding for early childhood programs in your community. Now, it may require some statute modifications. I don't know. You know I don't know if it's ready to go anymore at this stage, but it's something to think about. Another idea, and it's only an idea right now, is to advocate for legislation for ESUs to levy for early childhood programs. Okay, I'm looking right at our senators now. <laughs> um, aspirational, but think about it. So other questions we can ask, are we being intentional about what teachers and young families want so they will, they will come to our communities? We know that every community is going to be different, um, and, but the shared vision of everyone under the tent applies to everybody. So every community is, I'm just about ready to wrap here, every community is going to be different, um, and so Within your coalitions, you will determine what is best for your community and how to measure it. Learn all you can about your own community, whether on the negative or the positive side of child thriving continuum. For example, there are seven communities that may well want to be focused on teen parents. The red indicates that where in this state we have the highest percentage of teen parents. Or, next slide, the focus could be um, prenatal care as counties, again in red, um, with over 10% low birth weight suggest that as one important goal for getting children off to a good start. Or the desire of the community might be to increase um, childcare access or quality, and we've heard quite a bit about this already. Only four counties in red, now red's good on this map here, the one on the left, um, have 100 slots for every 100 children who need childcare. So please know that, note that 11 counties have no childcare facilities, those are the gray ones, and another four have only one to 24 slots for every 100 children who potentially need care. Another 14 counties have fewer than half the child care slots they potentially need. So people in these communities might focus on incentivizing child care, and it's not easy to do, I know that. Um, but make no mistake, 
Childcare access must go hand in hand with quality. Communities may want to focus on incentivizing or providing financial assistance so more providers can take part in Step Up to Quality. Challenging but hard. This um, little video is part of a beautiful longer series that First Five Nebraska has produced with, um, with Fire Spring, and it demonstrates that one community, uh, Wood River, has taken the ball into their own hands. So. 2017, Wood River Vision 2020 formed a task force to tackle this problem head on. And that process led to the idea of Stick Creek Kids Child Care Development Center. This will be a sustainable, licensed 501c3 program that delivers full day, year round care. In its first year, Stick Creek Kids will serve 35 children and grow to a total capacity of 80 children by year four. That's going to make a huge difference for Wood River's current and future families. Wood River Rural Schools fully supports the Stick Creek Kids Project. We know that quality early learning helps children succeed academically and socially in the long term. We're ready to make sure our own preschool program dovetails smoothly with the Stick Creek Kids curriculum so more children are ready to make the transition to school when it's time for them to do so. That's just part of the story. Everyone knows a strong educational system is a top consideration when choosing a place to grow, a career, raise a family, and put down roots. Quality services like Stick Creek Kids will improve our ability to attract and retain top teachers and grow Wood River's workforce overall. Even if you don't have young kids or need child care, you can see how that will benefit our economy and quality of life. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a retiree, whether you're a business owner here in Wood River or you work out of town, early childhood development, early childhood education, quality daycare matters to you. Good, thank you. So, uh, that brings us to the point we've heard several times today. When communities help children and caregivers thrive, communities can thrive too. We have the vision of attracting them, uh, attracting workers and early childhood services to small um, communities. So what's possible? My inspiration, I hope, um, their story is after World War II, communities in northern Italy wanted to rebuild and they decided the best way was to invest in young children. So these communities, maybe you've heard of them, maybe you've been there, Pistoia, Reggio Emilia, who's been to Reggio? Yes, um, they've, they've inspired us all. They determined that 25% or more of their city taxes would be devoted to young children. They established early childhood programs, parents were involved, the programs were high quality and dynamic. The community was part of the program. Children went to the piazza, you know, and painted pictures of children investigating how the water in those beautiful Italian fountains came to, came to flow through the um, pipe systems. Community and children were connected. So every day, um, even today, we have parks and local taxes to pay for schools, but this model of communities inspires us to be places where young children thrive no matter how we measure it. Nebraskans have always brought a great ethic to raising and living, uh, living and raising children. Our aspiration can become our inspiration. It is possible for Nebraska to be a great place to be a baby or a preschool or elementary age child where literally by all of our measures more and more children thrive every year. I have a few quick recommendations um, for you for your deliberations. You know, you're going to have many recommendations before you're done today. Um, many of you have early childhood coalitions, but if you don't, start there. Um, I recommend too that you think about how you measure progress. Consider a breadbasket of assets for your community. Um, some of you are already using the four part framework of America's promise that children are healthy, safe, ready for, and successful in school and have adequate supports. So that really fits, and you can develop a number of new indicators, such as um, of whether quality childcare is available to all parts of the community who need it, growing percentage of providers in step up to quality, as if you examples. Um, add that to your existing measures to reduce poverty, child abuse, percent of children in foster care, etc. 
Think about thriving in multiple ways, but include the positives as well as the negatives. And there is something I, I do want to say, I want to encourage you to consider, but maybe on a statewide basis, kindergarten readiness. I know everybody doesn't agree, but done the Nebraska way, I want you to think about that. And some beautiful communities in Nebraska may even figure out how to learn if children have a sense of wonder, because I saw people's hands there provide incentives for step up to quality, maximize funding, and don't be afraid to advocate for new and creative legislation. We're not gonna be able to do what we want to do overnight, so develop a one, three, five, and 10 year comprehensive plan. But if we set our intention, some of it will work out. Because after all, my last slide, this is Nebraska, where children are thriving and caregivers too. Um, and communities are too. I thank you. <laughs>